in, in, on a higher level in terms of uh, uh, thinking about the future. If the board and the executive are not working well, the organization suffers. When NIS gets called into schools that are in trouble, it's not just because the enrollment is, is weak. It's not just because the, you know, the fundraising isn't working. NIS gets called in, SAS, you'll, you'll call Deborah when the board culture is negative and things aren't working. And eventually, trust me, eventually that seeps down into the faculty and into the community, particularly in a day school where the parents of current students are on the board and when they're dropping off Jack in the third grade, uh, you, the third grade teacher says, well, you look really tired. Oh yeah, we were here till midnight last night talking about, oh, sorry, I can't talk to you about that. Um, <laughs> uh, people pay attention. Um, uh, lack of strategic alignment, you know, we're all about alignment. Get the mission, get the plan, make sure that they're aligned. If the chief executive officer, rephrase that, Jack, if the head of school and the board and the board chair aren't aligned and they're not talking in that partnership model, you're not gonna make any progress. It creates a toxic or contentious culture and, and then you don't get to leverage the, uh, the potential of both. I'm gonna keep moving really quickly here. Um, and there's lots of examples, but here again from Professor Chait, um, Again, it's not when, you, when boards don't do a good job, it's not that you've disappointed the shareholders, or the, in this case, the parents, or in this case, the faculty. It's the public good. There's, there's a higher standard. You have a responsibility. This isn't hyperbole. I believe this. I deeply believe this. The, your faculty deeply believe this, that our schools are there to serve a higher purpose. And you're there to make sure that that higher purpose stays intact. And when you don't do your job as a board, or the head of school doesn't do their job as a board, then that public good is not served well. Be clear, when there's a financial issue, a reputational issue, uh, or a legal issue of serious nature, call Deborah, um, boards lean in, to use a colloquial term, right? And that's your responsibility, financial, reputational, or legal. You need to lean in on that. The challenge is to resolve the problem, so heads of school hear this, resolve the problem, restore the confidence in, in the head, however that's done, new or different, and then the board needs to lean back out so that the, so that the head of school can do his or her job. And you know, so the, the college university level gives us way too many examples about boards not doing their job. Lots of other people didn't do their job, but remember at Michigan State, they got rid of a president, then they got rid of an interim president because he said, well, I think the people who are complaining just are enjoying the limelight, whoa. Not only what does that say about that individual, what does that say about the culture at Michigan State? That the interim president would think that was a good thing to say. It's a cultural issue. Uh, University of Southern California, the sexual abuse that occurred there. University of Maryland, you know, you know about this, the death of the football player? You know, when the board wanted to fire the president, the president wanted to fire the football player, the, uh, the head of the, the um, coach of the football team. You're, they were in the Washington Post for, you know, weeks. You don't want to be in the Washington Post, right? Uh, that's not a place we want to be. Or the most recent one, this is the best one, just a couple weeks ago. The University of Mississippi was looking for a new president, so they hired a search firm. And they went through every, all their candidates and then they took the search consultant, gave him a brief interview, didn't parade him around the campus, didn't have him talk to other people, and they appointed him to be the new president. Whoa, what's that about? It wasn't Dick Cheney. Um, uh, oh, I'm, uh, right, yeah. Um, so, and again, I, anybody graduates of the University of Mississippi or at USC or Mi Michigan State, I don't mean to offend you, but it says something about the culture, and here's the comment that you want to read. Um, oh, well, uh, you know this. I'm going to go very quickly. You know, uh, when you ask the public, this is just recent data uh, from this year, uh, from the folks at Pew, um, who do they trust? Members of Congress, nah, military leaders, no, journalists, no, technology company leaders, no, religious leaders, no, police officials, no, local elected officials, no, public school principals. The respondents, and Pew, you know Pew, Pew does big research. They don't ask 100 people, they ask 100,000 people. 84% said they believe and trust their public school principals because they believe they take care of their children. The families in your school believe you take care of the school which takes care of their children. It's all about trust. Um, here's what, this is T Bill Tierney, who's a research a faculty member at USC. And you know, at USC, uh, Max Nikias, big president, raised a ton of money. Did any, any USC folks out here? No? Anybody know anything about this? Not too much. Um, there was sexual abuse allegations all over the place. And Tierney, rather than pointing fingers at the president, who had to resign, well, who resigned, 
uh, rather than pointing fingers at his behavior, there are plenty of, plenty of reasons to do that, to wonder about that. But Tierney asks about what's the culture uh, that creates these kinds of situations, whether it's Penn State, where people said, you know, the trustees didn't lean in at all, right? Or whether it was the University of Virginia, where the trustees leaned in quite heavily and said to the president, you know, the university isn't doing good work in online learning, so we're going to fire you. And they ended up in the Washington Post for about a month. Um, the faculty stood up and said, time out board, we create the, fa we create the curriculum, you don't. Back off, the governor got involved. Guess what happened? The president who was fired became, was restored as the president. But they spent months on the front page of the Washington Post. I, had a, um, I was doing this work in California a couple weeks ago. I said, the fellow said to me, Jack, this has nothing to do with independent schools. What are you talking about? Why are you talking, giving us these examples? This has everything to do with independent schools and the nature of decisions you make ensconced within the culture that you're, that you're creating. Um, so think about tyranny when he talks about this messy term culture. It's way easier to hire and fire faculty. It's way easier to get, for you all to get involved in the hiring and firing process of faculty. It's much harder for you to think about um, trust. We're going to go blow right through this. The, here's the partnership model, right? In order to build that trust, the board chair and the head of school have to have a tight relationship. The head of school has to have a good and tight relationship with the board. Um, here's from Covey, right? Everybody believes Covey. Uh, just think about what is your level of confidence in trust uh, in this person? And that leads into their agenda, their capabilities, or their track record. So here you go. The NAS board chair is from Amada's uh, um, recent um, uh, survey. Uh, it's important for the board chair to be able to resolve conflict and build consensus. We're going to talk about who should the board chair be, who should you look for. Well, here's one of the characteristics. Um, resolve conflict and build consensus on the way to creating a positive board culture. Builds a trusting environment. 80%. To get head of, head of, heads of school to agree 80% on anything is pretty difficult. They certainly agree on this. Uh, cultivates constructive partnerships with the head of school. The board chair has to do that. 86% of the heads of school agree to that. Establishes clear expectations of service. The board chair, does he or she do that? 70% agree. Not so good uh, in terms of that. Encourages the board to frame questions and discuss strategically. What do the heads think about that? Only 72% think that the boards do that well. So these are the key behaviors, <laughs> key skills of a board chair needs to have in terms of building a positive board culture. Um, resolves conflict, build consensus, operates in a trusting environment. These are all the kinds of things. If we had more time, I was going to have you do an assessment about your board and say, think about your board. How good is it at resolving conflict? Operates in a trusting environment. Cultivates a constructive partnership. Establishes clear expectations of service. One would be needs improvement. You'll get this. You can do this when you go home. Or you can do this at your next board meeting. Wouldn't that be an interesting generative activity instead of talking about the budget, which you just talked about 30 days ago? Nothing's happened in the last 30 days. Trust me. Um, establishes clear expectations of service. Uh, make sense of questions and discuss this strategically. Forget that agenda you've got for your next board meeting and put this in there and evaluate it. Evaluate yourself. Five is wicked good. I grew up in Boston. That's how we describe things. We say they're wicked good. Uh, and have a conversation about this. This is, NAS keeps telling you, SAS keeps telling you, have generative conversations. Look at the financials, make sure everybody's doing a fine job. You know, if you're in a strategic plan, see where you're at. But have this conversation. And then ask, well, if we're only a bunch of threes, none of our schools are threes, right? We're all fives. But if we're only a bunch of threes as a board, what do we have to do to make it better? Um, uh, here's a diversity question. Uh, Amada talked about this. It's essential. The re this is research. This is, in my opinion, NAS's opinion, SAS's opinion. Uh, board source can tell you this. Uh, here's, I, I, I showed this uh, to a, a group a couple uh, actually, a couple years ago, and someone said, well, Jack, you think these are the only tasks that women can do? Absolutely not. That's not what this is saying. But it does say, often, when in terms of gender balance, these are the areas that may be missing in terms of board expertise. And the data indicates that women often bring these skills, these sets of experiences. In addition to being wonderful financial managers, in addition to being major, as CEOs of major uh, governments. Um, diversity. Here's from um, we'll go through this very, I don't want to go too quickly. Donna Orm and Caroline Blackwell at the People of Color Conference a couple of years ago. How, how, how do you do this? It's the board's responsibility 
in terms of board membership to articulate a compelling vision and to lead by example in terms of policies and practices that you have and to ground diversity recruitment in governance practices, not in the middle school recruitment, not in the uh, curriculum for the upper school, but in the work you do. What are the diversity practices that you engage in? I love this one. Avoid tokenism. Well, Jack, we've already, we, we invited one person of color this year. That's enough. We'll do another next year. Let's do something a little radical. Let's be disruptive. Why don't you invite three people of color on the board this year to fill the three empty slots? Oh, I, uh, I don't know, Jack. That make me a little uncomfortable. Is that the right thing to do? I don't know. Why don't you try it and see what happens? See how it changes the conversation so there's not just one of me or one person who looks like me who has experiences like me, but three of me's up there. How would that change? You want to change your board? Don't do one. Do three. See what that might uh, look like. And then make sure you're building the pipeline to change things around. Um, uh, here's the executive committee. We've already done this, but here's what uh, Joyer says. If any committee of the board knows something, it's the right and responsibility of the full board to know it also. You should be incensed if the executive committee comes to you and tells you something that they've been talking about for a month and you're a board member and you don't know it. Governance is the legal and moral authority of the full board. Um, here, evidence of what a, a generative culture looks like. I'm way over time here. Um, these are the questions you can and should ask. Renegades are sanctioned. Elevate the governance committee. Uh, uh, how do you do this? How do you disagree during the board meeting? Um, uh, uh, this is, this is uh, marriage therapy 101. Uh, this is counseling uh, 101. Disagree with the ideas, not the individual. Uh, respond with a spirit of inquiry. Say, well, do you have an example of that? Well, how, how would you support that? We do that in our classes. You know, someone says to me, well, I think, uh, I think Macbeth is a comedy. Really? Okay, centuries of scholarship say no, but show me in the text where that is. Well, I think our school should spend more money advertising here. Okay, why? Do you have anything other than your observation when you're driving through the neighborhoods that this looked like a good place to spend some money, that that would be a good uh, something, some place to do? Separate the personalities from idea. You've got, you know all this, right? Ensure that disagreement is expressed sensitively. You know, maybe there's a need for the communications expert to come in, not talk to you just about crisis, but how to communicate well. You know, I have a friend who says a board of trustees is composed it's, a, it's an incompetent group of competent people. That's kind of offensive. But that's who you are working in the nonprofit world, some would argue, um, to sit down and talk about things. Um, uh, let's, we'll do a case study. Here's just um, if, if good old Pine Tree Academy was debating how best to proceed with a major gift from a trustee, trustee who wanted to expand the technology and makerspace center, the donor is a tech leader believes the future success of the school depends on more technology and is pushed to say, let's be high tech high of whatever the school is. The donor is a powerful voice during meetings. How would this conversation occur on a board that was characterized by a positive board culture? How would that conversation occur on a board that didn't have a positive culture? That's worth thinking about. Talk about that at your next board meeting. Because if I am the major donor and have been for a long time and you all need some money, the head of school may say, well, you're absolutely crazy. Yeah, if he wants to give us that money, let's go ahead and do that. I had a donor once say, hey, I'd like to build you a track. And he told me that because the donor's son asked the English department chair, who was also the track coach, what did the school need? And the guy said, we need a track. So the parents came to me and said, hey, we hear you need a track. We'd like to donate it. I said, we don't need a track. <laughs> they eventually donated a residence hall for us. But you know, you gotta be careful where people get these ideas. So anyways, think about where a positive and a negative board culture would lead this conversation. I think it's time for lunch, yes? That was awesome. Thank you, Jack. Yeah. yeah.